going to uh, speak about uh, the CITSE, Children's Identity Citizenship in Europe, and also <coughs> to present you uh, his thoughts. Good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me to this conference. I'm very pleased to be here and to meet you all. Um, I've been asked before I speak uh, on my main topic about the GJ, SICE organization, the Children's Identity and Citizenship in Europe, which I think many of you here are already aware of, but uh, I'd like to invite you all to become involved in its activities. It's been, it's a European uh, Commission academic network that was set up uh, 13 years ago and is running for at least the next three years. It's funded on a three-year roaming basis by the Commission. It brings together about 100 universities in some 32 European countries, all of whom have got an interest in children's identity and children's citizenship in the European context. The, those words in the title are important. We use the word children because we're referring to all those young people from the age of zero up to 18, We're not simply interested in secondary education, but also in primary, in school people, We're interested in their identities, how they construct their sense of who they are, and we're interested in citizenship, how they belong to a particular society or community, be that uh, their school, their city, their country, or Europe. Um, and it's got a particular European connection because European citizenship is something that uh, we, unlike the rest of the world, all share and we have a formal European identity citizenship as well as one of our own national state identities. It's a network. It doesn't actually technically do anything. And it brings together people in an annual conference in a series of applications, in various short-term activities that, that are decided on a rolling basis um, two or three years at a time. It has no uh, overall program um, of research or publication or academic work that runs on the whole time. It constructs its agenda for itself and it constructs meetings for itself and it brings together, let's say, several hundred academics now from these universities who um, use the network to meet and to plan and to organize their own activities from that. You're very welcome to join either the network or which is done through a university, it's a university affiliation, or individually through uh, an independent association called the CICE Association, um, which is open to individual members, produces its own journal, and has another set of activities around that, including the opportunity for travel grants, for small research grants, and for visiting, uh, having bases to visit in other countries if you need to do that for your research or academic work. So that is the CIC um, <coughs> network that um, I've been asked to introduce to you, and which is one of the sponsors of this meeting today. So if I can turn now to um, my main presentation, Young People's Constructions of Identity in the Visible United States. This is one of a series of analyses of how young Europeans and their identities, how they construct these, how they conceptualize these in the changing political context and the circumstances of Europe, and how they see themselves as different older generations. The whole project uh, investigates teenagers in the stream of countries from Estonia in the north through East and Central Europe, the Balkans to Turkey and Cyprus in the south. And the political status of these countries has changed over the past 20 years from being behind the Iron Curtain to being part of the European Union or to be about to join the European Union. The eastern borders of the European Union have passed over them in this period. They have a new set of relationships with the countries of Western Europe and with Russia and the residual elements of the power that was once dominant in their economies and societies. 
So these people are the first generation to be born and thus wholly socialized within these new polities. How different are they from their parents, who grew up in the communist or socialist states, saw the events of 1989, and some of them participated in the fall of the former regimes? How different are they from their grandparents, many of whom can remember the Second World War? I've chosen to address these questions by talking to young people in focus groups across these countries, trying to get them to construct their own discourses to describe who they think they are. Civic and identity and citizenship have been traditionally associated with a defined and, well, that's right, just to show you the, the moving borders of the European Union. Uh, civic identity and citizenship have been traditionally associated with a defined and exclusive area. This has been partly eroded through processes like globalization, large scale migration, and the development of dual citizenship. And citizenships, citizens of these countries are now also citizens of the European Union, and this gives them rights and privileges superior to those given by their own country. The border of the European Union has moved since its inception in 1956, and its most recent expansion in 2008, <coughs> and further border movements are being planned in recent years. Identities are becoming increasingly recognized as both multiple and constructed contingently they contain intersecting dimensions including gender, age, and region. As I say, this country covers uh, 14 countries, the candidate countries that will probably join the Union shortly, and countries that have joined in the past six years. And today I'm going to focus particularly on the Visegrad states, Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary. I'm going to use two particular frameworks in this analysis of entities. Michael Bruton, analyzing the emergence of mass European identity, particularly in Western Europe, describes civic identities as having two components the civic identification with the civic institutions, the rights, the rules that preside over the political life of the community, and the cultural identification with a certain culture, social similarities, and values. Lynn Jameson and Sue Dunn <coughs> use a different set of for instance, to see some young people as presenting themselves as passionate utopian Europeans or passionate utopian about their own state, while for many others, either their own state or being European, remains emotionally insignificant and devoid of imagined community or steps towards a global citizenship. So I'm going to use these dimensions to look at the people and people in the United States. Do young people identify themselves with cultural and civic? Or the civic in their own community, in their own country? Or do they do this in Europe, which they identify as cultural, civic, or both? Are they passionate or indifferent about their European identities? Or about their own country's identification? Do they have singular identities? Or do they have a sense of multiplicity in having several? that is at the same time. Does their identity require the construction of the other, an alien identity, held in juxtaposition to their own identity? This question is of particular significance to the subject of the study. As the borders of the European Union continue to expand, where in the minds of these young people are the limits of Europe? Where does the frontier lie? These are complex questions. Putting them directly to young people will not lead to coherent answers. They may not consider them, and they may feel obliged by the context of an interview to provide an answer. They may feel constrained by how they would write direct questions. They will almost inevitably use the language of instructions of the questioner in making any response. And my study is about how these young people's ideas are socially constructed. Social constructions are created through interactions in a social con context. So I've been using focus groups of five to six young people at the same age who are given a very few open-ended questions and encouraged to discuss them. They interact with each other rather than with the researcher, using the ideas, the vocabulary, the language of their own choosing rather than responding to me. And 
discussion points were very broad. How would you describe an entity? What does being a rich check mean to you? Do you ever describe yourselves in other ways? Do you think your parents, your grandparents, feel the same way about this as you do? Do you think everyone in the or the Czech Republic feels the same way as you do? How does being in Europe affect the way you think about an entity? Is there anything particular or different about Europeans? And finally, can you imagine some appropriate neighbor, Russia, Belarus, Turkey, being, uh, becoming part of the European Union? So these are the questions that I've gently interjected into these conversations about 40 minutes each with um, these young people. The focus groups took place between January 2010 and January 2011. 11 locations were visited in larger cities and provincial towns, ensuring a very wide <coughs> range and spread. So, Poland, in the Czech Republic, in Slovakia, and in Hungary. More in Poland because Poland is a much bigger population. Give me more of a feel of that. As you can see, they're scattered around the countries, nearly 250 children in all in, in life. In each location, two or three schools with different social mixes were selected, and each school, two groups of either 12 to 13 year olds, 15 to 16 year olds, with a variation there sometimes. Commissions uh, sought from the young people, and for those under 16, from their parents. It's not a representative sum. It's not supposed to cover the entire country and represent the country as a whole. But it's supposed to, it is supposed to, I hope, show the diversity of views <coughs> that were expressed. I wasn't concerned with legal nationality or status, but of young people whose homes in these areas. So if there are significant minorities or migrants, some of these may also be included. And my approach was that the sole researcher. I had a complete overview of the whole process and the data. There was only one subjectivity, mine, interpreting the data. I don't think objectivity is possible or meaningful in a research of this nature. So this approach means that everything is subject to the same observer interpretation. Positively, this may see this as a weakness, but I see it as a strength. And the project wouldn't be possible without the help of a large number of people, some of whom are here today, um, to whom I'm greatly indebted. Schools and parents have been recruited, and arrangements that make visits and critically help given in translating many of the transcripts. So thank you to all these people. They Significant first impression on that of, of the whole process has been how articulate and how thoughtful nearly all the young people have been. They have, after some initial hesitation, become involved in serious debate, setting out ideas that reflect interest and reflection on all these areas. And secondly, I'd say that many teachers have been very surprised at the level of engagement the young people have been able to have and the depth of their knowledge. So, an aside, I'd say that generally <coughs> teachers, educationists ignore these areas of understanding in their young people and um, let them on, on their own. And they're not aware of how interested and articulate they can be in talking about these areas. Now, to give a brief overview, I'm going to talk about identifications with the nation and the country and identification to Europe in this opening January. This afternoon I'm going to expand this and carry on and talk about the difference, differences with the other in further east parts of Europe, differences with the other in Turkey, differences to grandparents, parent generational differences, and talk about singular and multiple identities. But this morning I'm going to focus on those first two. So identification with the country and the nation. There were many references to cultural manifestations with the country. That there were, there were more of those than there were to the structures and institutions and symbols of the nation. So 
I'm going to look first of all at those references to institutions, and then to references to cultural aspects. Um, and then finally I'll see how enthusiastic and indifferent they were to those two. In all countries, there were references to institutional structures, such as symbols and flags and the national anthem, public holidays, and the specific national symbols, such as the Hungarian crown, the Polish eagle. Some participated in national day parades, but I have to say for most of them, there was not a great sense of the nation as being an institution. As Alexandra put it, for the most part, Poles are concerned with the idea of national history. And probably for the most part, they're not aware that they are Poles unless they're reminded of it. The only sign is hanging out the flag on November the 11th. But apart from that, there are no signs, no indications, nothing. Polina, also in Poland, referred to the Lati as being one of the distinctive features of her own national entity. In the Czech Republic, Poland, there were references to freedoms associated with their countries. Belenza referred to the changes. In the past, people didn't have the chance to be free. Since the end of the Cold War, people began to feel liberty. Ludmila said she wasn't a religious person, and I'm not forced to be one in our country. National institutions and governments were often criticized. One group in Pech uh, ran through a whole range of criticisms about their different institutions. The government was divisive in helping the rich get richer, overtaxing the <coughs> politicians misused union funds, and inappropriate educational policies. Many of them felt cheated. Only the extremists, left and right, would feel proud of their Hungarian politics. Several young Poles referred to the lack of economic prospects. Poles were hard workers, but had few opportunities other than to emigrate. There were, though, some voices supporting national institutions. For example, Yudushan said he was happy to be a Czech person. There are other parts of the world that are not as good. Our social services are quite good. And Budapest, Nikita said, Nowadays, people are not so proud of being Hungarian. In a way, it's understandable. The main point is not that someone has a nationality, but when you're clever, want to excel, then you can do it. Good wine. <laughs> and they love too. There were many more references to cultural practices and activities. In sport, there were references to Hungary, to fencing, water polo, handball, athletics, and particular references to football, to French Pukas, Golden team of the 1950s. <coughs> Various Czech young people referred to their pride in ice hockey, hockey, and national football teams. In Poland, Claudia said, when a Polish sports team win, there's a kind of joy, even though it's not exactly me, my country represents, it, represents something. In contrast, Slovakia, uh, Polish said, I'm interested in what's going on in other states, because in Slovakia, nothing is going on. Uh, liking for food and drink were consistently mentioned. In Poland, there were specific dishes, bigos, like traditional meals at Christmas, national dishes in the Czech Republic and Slovakia, and in Hungary, proprietary products such as eroshkista, which is paprika and yurika. Hungarians referred to beer, and a television advert for Supreme. Folk music in his work, 
But now I think it's the end of this associated with this from extreme nationalists who are trying to appropriate uh, Hungarian voters as being, as being Hungarian, specifically nationalist in Hungary. Poland, the poets were mentioned. There were mixed opinions on national dress. Um, one of them said that while people in the villages wear traditional clothing, um, I never wear that. Ever. Language was a particular unifying cultural identifier in almost every location. We have a distinct culture, we have a language. And they say we speak a uh, Hungarian language and nobody else does. But this is an attachment to the national language, including making it purity. I think we should introduce words from the languages, but instead cultivate our own. It's very important we should use our language and remember where it comes from. Many young people uh, ascribe behavioural characteristics to the people of their country. Hungarians are described um, as being clever, friendly, and with no influence. Mr. Parkins described himself as being warm-hearted and calm, and less ambitious than other people. One young Polish man said, we're very emotional about politics. Polish people really like to argue, make a fuss about nothing. Uh, another way of asserting cultural identity was through nominating prominent fellow citizens. And history and general culture were also. <coughs> I'm proud of my history of Hungary. Um, uh, Hungary's history, I'm proud of the people who live here. This needed to be preserved and defended. Slovaks are a cultural state, and we managed to preserve it. Or was under some kind of existential threat. Nowadays, we don't have much difference in other countries. We have to feel that we are Polish people. All Souls Day was mentioned several times, particularly <coughs> rejection of the Halloween traditions of American imports. The Polish young people appeared particularly insistent in their stress on history and culture. Claudia here says, I feel connected to Poland and to the history. When I recall the history of this nation, there is an emotion in me. I feel sentimental about being Polish. And there are other references to the traditional patriotic slogan, God, honor, and our land, which is most important for Poles. It lives on. Many people want to divide themselves with these values. <coughs> Staying with the Poles for a moment, um, there were some differences about whether Polish identity was associated particularly with Catholicism. Um, one young man said, Poland is the most Catholic country in Europe, except for the Vatican. And another, another one said, this gives us a moral spine. But such views were not universal. We shouldn't look at our entities to the themes of the church. Because of the Catholic doctrines, we became an enclosed country. Beatrice said, although she felt that there was a religious element of Poland's past, now one can be a patriot and not believe in God, not be a religious person. Several regarded the division as being to do with generations. We were religious a couple of decades ago, in the communist period, religion mattered. Now religion doesn't matter so much in the younger generation. Problems of distance are concerned to this generation, include homophobia and euthanasia, clearly uh, two areas which um, connect directly with the, the nature of Catholicism and Catholic religion. Several references to older poles cling to Catholicism related to the Smolensk air crash of April 2010, in which 96 leading <coughs> establishments, including the president, died. A um, large cross was erected near the presidential palace in Warsaw, and again, a, a, a symbolic rallying point for many older Catholics and more conservative poets. And when the government sought to move this overt religious symbol to the nearby cathedral, um, a vigil was mounted to prevent the cross and the cross affair demonstrated generational and political divisions in the minds of these young people. The older generations were very pro putting a monument there to commemorate the deaths. And the younger generation just stood there for fun, just to watch the whole cross affair. And other girls would be going and more fierce of Britain. The Catholic Church also <coughs> and was attacking religion with the people who hypocritically call themselves Catholics and try to convert others. Take their religion. 
and there were other references which I could go on at better great length, references to a shared Slavic culture, culture in Poland and the Czech Republic, Slovakia, for example, and references to similarities and differences between Czechs and Slovaks. Turning now to whether there's enthusiasm or indifference for the country, I think what I found I suggested that there's probably more enthusiasm for the cultural aspects of national identity than for the institutions and structures of the country. There are many references to a sense of national pride in the culture and independence of the country. Proud to be Polish, proud of its history, yes. And they include an awareness of recent changes. Our life is much better than that of our mothers and grandmothers. Um, we have more opportunities in life. There's no oppression. Some felt an obligation to preserve this culture. The value of national culture was not confined to those who originated the country. There are a number of examples of those foreign or mixed descent affirming their enthusiastic participation and membership of the local culture. There was also evidence that some were critical of the national culture. This was partly a comparison with their parents' earlier experiences, when national culture was sometimes perhaps clearer and sometimes expressed as a lack of solidarity, a particularly significant word in Polish. Right now, we're lacking in solidarity. We're a common idea should you have the nation. We've lost what we had. We had solidarity, and we're only divided now. But there was more criticism of national structures and institutions and other nationalism. Politicians were generally held to be in low esteem. In Slovakia, Goslav said, the politicians grab everything. We have nothing, everything is corrupt. Being a kind of disappointment. In Poland, Dominic said the opinion was quite widespread that politicians are generally <coughs> rather than stupid and idiots. Politicians were also held responsible for the frustration young people expressed about the national economy. In Ostrava, Barbara said this country is going to disintegrate and fall apart. And Miela said the country is not well developed. The state is not developed. The young people I spoke to were largely patriotic, very patriotic in the sense that they professed affection for their country and its culture, but asserted that they themselves were not nationalistic. They had a clear perception that they were a number of white, uh, young white being nationalists in their communities, and many disassociated themselves from such movements and beliefs. This emerged most clearly in Hungary, where the revanchist Greater Hungary movement, the Magyar Koda, real Hungarians, um, were clinging to restoration of the country's borders before the 1920 Treaty of Tiananmen. Ikatho said, most of the people don't feel proudly of being Hungarian, many think that we do, and there are all these icons of the Greater Hungary movement that you see around um, being used on monkeys, on tattoos, sports shirts, and on um, you know, for dog costumes there. Um, so the implications of Europe has moved to, to, to that. Um, unlike reference to their country, their own countries, there are more references to the institutions and practices of Europe and European bodies than there were to European cultural manifestations. Many were quite positive and enthusiastic about the possibilities of study, travel, and work in other European countries and of the European Union's policies that supported this. Not all were in favour of European integration, and some were cautious about adopting the Euro. European culture was generally defined as less robust than the culture of their own country. So, Europe provided solidarity, a cooperative connectivity. Europe means that we help each other. The countries are in a group as a whole. Some saw the European Union as promoting equality between countries, but others contested this. One said he felt more connected to Poland than to the European Union. However, maybe in 50 years or so, we'll be more connected to Europe. The freedom to cross European borders without passports is one of the most frequently cited examples of being European. We can travel where we want to in the EU. Schengen is perfect, I think. To Thomas, it made him feel a citizen of the world, not just of Europe, but of the whole world. And this travel wasn't just for cultural purposes. Like I said, it's for studying, for living, for working. I believe I will live more happily and more successfully. Studying abroad was mentioned by many. 
from every location, and particularly by the older students. The European Union element of this was not just free movement, specific educational projects were identified. This is Erasmus program. Um, students can go abroad. Being from the European Union come many language projects for young people and adults. It's good. Working in another European country was also seen as an ambition, but perhaps more often either for opportunity, almost as a necessity. The institution of the European Union was seen by many as more than the typical of though the century travels having in work. There were also references to democratic processes and rights that came from membership. This was not just a democratic process of decision making but a recognition that human rights were integral to European Union membership. Poland, or Kiev, said, we have rights in the European Union, we have guarded by the law. In the Czech Republic, I said the other, particularly referred to women's rights, for example. And these things emerged particularly in discussions about which other countries might possibly join the Union in the future, particularly the suggestion of either Russia or Belarus. It was only then at that point that most young people and in fact particularly Polish young people, identified the democratic element of the European Union. Being in the European Union is to feel free. I feel free in both in Belarus, but that has changed things in the country. Membership of the European Union would require changes in political behaviour. In theory, every country in Europe could be in the European Union, but they need to respect rights. If human rights are broken, I don't think they can join. Peace, no defining feature. The most important thing about Europe is the certainty that tomorrow I can wake up in my place and do not have to be afraid. Widening membership is a way of extending security. So these notions of Europe are centered around having particular rights, having democracy, and freedoms. Another important European institutional practice for many was the economic and financial support given by many countries. There were references to wealth redistribution and an understanding that members of the Union meant there'd be assistance in times of need. The countries helped each other. Others mentioned the targeted support of infrastructure, physical and other. We can get money from the European Union for culture and other things, particularly progress, but as when we can become citizen, uh, citizen of European culture here in, in four years' time. Um, so this policy was seen by some ways as extending support beyond Europe. Europe helps other nationalities. Not everyone, however, felt this financial support helped them feel more European. The possible introduction of the Euro, other than Slovakia, was more controversial. And the reservations about Europe were only occasionally matters of the institutions. Objections were generally to cultural integration, really to political union. The European Union is okay, but not one country. Not now, after a hundred years or something. So European culture was characterized by references to diversity and the lack of definable core. Where core elements were defined, such as history, or being Christian, or being white, this was invariably contested by others. A common way of agreeing European culture was in fact to contrast it with the culture of the USA. There was a general resistance to an introduction to the European. If European countries get together, traditions will disappear. European identity doesn't exist too much, said Hamas. Some Hungarians, when asked to define what was common amongst Europeans, contrasted Europe with Hungary, or most other of themselves as being non European. Most young Europeans claim that Europeans, Europe's distinctiveness is its cultural diversity. Europe is specific in having many cultures. <coughs> and this was often seen positive. positive. Jeremy had suggested that the European Union's motto of unity and diversity meant that Europe should develop common rules and keep diversity. And some behavioural characteristics of Jews. Europeans are more polite, Europeans are more well mannered, Europeans are modest. Another suggestion was Europe is very liberal and tolerant. There were many assertions that Europe had a particular had a particularly rich historical culture. Europe is more specific than other continents. And the history of Europe is very rich, more than other countries. More rich, but not necessarily more shared. Or the first marks of European culture appear in Europe, or culture appear in Europe, so Europe must be specific. Some of these are quite detailed, albeit very inaccurate. 
all the basic things um, were created or registered in, in Europe, the first months of Europe, culture in Europe, so Europe must be specific. There were appeals to antiquity, ancient Greeks and ancient Rome were the roots of Europe. They were not qualify this nature of the element of progress. The ancient Greeks, before Christ, had offered up a lot of things in science and art. And when Christianity came, they suppressed all of these ideas and people. There was quite a lot of discussion about Christianity as a possible criterion of European identity. Uh, some saw Christianity as a fundamental part of Europe. Christianity prevailed in Europe. You could distinguish people by their religion and by oppressing it. But more young people were more nuanced, counter saying. In Europe, people are less religious than other continents. Religion is also seen as a potential threat, either from the potential growth of Islam, when Turkey joined the European Union, then the civilization of Europe will go further and further, or a potential area of discord. Another area of debate was whether Europe was white. Several young people put forward a view of whiteness as a definition. The Europeans one like was a white color skin, like who looks like me, and there were also explicit other things about where contrasts about culture, usually negative, were made with cultures of other countries, particularly the USA. European culture could be defined because the US was different in significant ways, such as the prevalence of violent crime, a lack of history and commercialization. But the biggest difference it defined was the dietary. Uh, Americans eat more. These observations demonstrated European moral superiority. We are healthier, everything is healthier in Europe. In Europe, people think about things, Americans aren't as reflective as us. So how does this impact on notions of Europe, enthusiasm or indifference for Europe? There's a great deal of variation between individuals. Either how enthusiastic they engage with Europe or a subject of their own indifference. But broadly, the enthusiasm was for European institutions and policies, and the indifference or uncertainty was about the conception of a common culture. The reasons for being positive about the human identity were various. In terms of policy, it caused security and safety. I think the European community means safety. They're surrounded by friendly people <coughs> who are together. Solidarity and a sense of being interconnected were associated with this. It's special because it connects countries. A sense of continuity was comforting when traveling. There's a sense of uh, equity between their commons. It's a policy to reduce differences in countries and regionality. Maybe they can help us if we need some help. This sense of political unity, liberalism, tolerance, was stressed by several people. The very idea of creating the European Union was really to unite the countries to take down the barriers between them. There were more instrumentally direct positive arguments, particularly on travel and study. Not thinking of ease of travel, but the sense of gave to the traveller outside Europe. There are advantages to travelling Europe one. As I arrive in Australia, I say I'm European. Similarly, it's not just improved access to studying in Europe, but a specific programme to tackle the sense of being. <coughs> Europe is an educational centre. It means opportunities for travelling and studying abroad, but it's a programme that means to feature. It's of more importance to say that you're a European than you're a slow matter. There was also some appreciation of European cultural traditions. I feel more European than Polish. The European Union is getting more and more united culturally, different from America, different from Russia. Not always. I think we the European, and even then describe what being European means. And there was also challenges to the European economic dimension, more products taken from abroad, which were the Hungarian products. So money is used by Hungarians within the country. And there are specific criticisms of European policy that <coughs> international insufficient attention to international and global issues, ecological problems, deforestation, and so on. Europe is not concerned enough with issues of the global environment, air pollution, and so on. And there were expressions of concern about Europe's effects on cultural matters national entity remain central to their lives, but then national sentiment trumped the European. Culture is a national, and a person feels more strongly connected to Polish values and Polish culture and cannot feel part of Europe. I think we did all that for us. Countries are more and more similar to the European Union. Of course, this is 
too many ethnic issues of sexism and racism. I don't like it if it happens, especially in Europe. But, in all of these confusing doubts, it was pronounced sense that the human identity that they were expressing was particularly associated with the younger generation. I think this is our future, not my parents or my grandparents. The European generation is a chunk for my generation to work. And I'm going to come on to those generational differences this afternoon. So, so far, I've covered those first two topics. This afternoon, I will carry on with this exposition and this project to talk about the remaining uh, floor on the screen there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also, Professor Rose, uh, for this interesting introduction. Uh, and I also want to thank to SICE Project to support this conference. Uh, maybe you allow me to say that uh, speaking about ch children's identity, the SICE Project is something like your child. <laughs> because you worked uh, as a president of this project. And uh, thank also, uh, I want to thank also to London Metropolitan University to support our conference. Thank you very much. And now, uh, I'm sorry, we are not, uh, uh, we are not uh, professional organizers, so I uh, ask keynotes to switch a little bit because we have only one, uh, only one uh, uh, computer. So I ask uh, my colleague from uh, Charles University of Prague, uh, Associate Professor.